Well, hello, boys and girls. Welcome to the Wireless Village, and um, welcome to the talk that Dominic and, our, and I are about to give. Um, I'm Russ. I'm, I'm Dominic. Yes. And it's been 13 hours since Sorry. my last shell. Sorry, I was playing with the microphone switch, and I was really hoping it was going to work. <laughs> and it very smoothly worked, and then I spoiled it by going, yes, after getting my name out. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm Dominic, this is Russ. Uh, we're going to talk about It's Not Wi-Fi, um, which is largely about wireless reverse engineering and what you do with signals you might find that are kind of non-standard and, and things like that. Um, and there are some pictures of us on the slides. Um, in provocative poses, because, I mean, we still can do this through erotic interpretive dance. We can. I, I really can't. I can't bend. Do you want to move on? Okay, I, we can No, move I was on. just going to say I can't bend that way at this, this point in the weekend. Um, so, so this talk uh, idea came out um, a few weeks ago when Russ, Russ emailed me to say, happy it's not Wi-Fi day, uh, which is celebrating the second anniversary of a, a very very, very long email thread the two of us had with um, someone who we'd, we'd met via a mailing list who was really, really keen to show us captures of these weird signals they were seeing. And these weird signals were kind of like fairly common. They were relatively strong no matter where he went. We saw, uh, it's stuff that we have all seen and recognized over and over. And part of the frustration was the stubbornness of the individual who was seeking not just advice from us, but from a lot of other people to include some of the other uh, wizards in the space like Dragorn and Mike Osman. Right. And it just went on and on. Uh, so in other words, he was like shopping for an answer uh, that placated his particular narrative. R right. He was looking for someone to confirm his assumption that he discovered something nefarious from the government. And and I, what happened on this this given day is at some point he just sends this 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 cap this giant capture file through yeah. and and audio decodings of it and I'm like audio's not going to work it's Wi-Fi and it's, okay okay like, but it's not Wi-Fi can you can you help me with the analysis let's get past the it's Wi-Fi thing and I was like but what it's do you not Wi-Fi yeah what do you what do you mean let's get past the it's Wi-Fi thing and he's like well because it's not Wi-Fi it's not like, Wi-Fi well why I, can't I it be Wi-Fi I don't think because we can get past this mate and like yeah anyway. Anyway. So, so uh, Russ emails me to celebrate this every year, but he did once send me a 51-page PDF of his oh, yeah. analysis of this signal, some screenshots of which appear in this talk. And uh, also, that was a risky click of a PDF to open, because if Travis Goodspeed has taught us anything, that PDFs can be a very dangerous uh, yeah. <laughs> type of document to send around to just random people. So yeah, I mean, th this is a great phishing attack, actually. <laughs> like, get me so invested in proving to you that you're wrong on the internet. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then send me a PDF and I'll click on that. So in, at the end of the day, uh, we both felt that there was this common narrative about people seeking assistance on uh, signals and things that they were trying to decode. I saw this thing, and what do I do with it? So this is essentially going to be our advice to everyone else uh, in the room when you do come across something that you don't necessarily recognize and how to approach it. And what I'm probably going to suggest that you do with it other than beating yourself and, into the wall head first. Yeah, and, and this also kind of uh, sets down some ideas of what you can do before you ask for help. And that's not to say we or other people aren't super willing to help you, but... Um, if you send if you send me screenshots of a weird signal, I can't decode it from the screenshot. Well, actually, that's not well, true because we're about to we're do about that. to do that. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> but I can't really decode it from the screenshot. Like, it, there are a lot of things you can do to help yourself before you help, ask for help, and there are a lot of extra information. Like my. When I provide support for open source software, my first question to a lot of users is, what are you trying to achieve? Because usually what they're trying to solve is problem X, and they come and ask me about problem X, and I solve problem X for them, and they say, well, this, but, but that solution to problem X doesn't solve problem Y. And I was like, well, no. And they say, but originally I was trying to solve problem Y, and like, why didn't you ask me about problem Y in the first place? Because here's the like two minute one line solution to that. <laughs> but we spent three days going around to solve problem X because you thought it would solve problem Y. It's called the XY problem. There's a website about it, and it's, uh, it, it's just frustrating because it's a waste of uh, everybody's time, including the person looking for help. Exactly. So when it comes to all things wireless, radio, and so on and so forth, it starts with your antenna. 
and it starts with your equipment, and it starts with how you're going to start observing the signals. Many folks try, uh, in my experience, uh, approach wireless communications because Wi-Fi is wireless. Well, there's actually a whole bunch of abstraction layers between when you receive that packet uh, on the wire or via the kernel space from what's actually happening in the radio interface. So when people uh, start using their RTLs or any one of the other uh, permutations of capabilities that are out there to start uh, receiving signals, there's some very basic things that they have to get sorted out in the first place. And uh, this is an old picture from a, a talk that uh, Dragorn and Zero and myself had given many years ago. And it was uh, with the RTL SDRs, like the little things that you could buy on Amazon. When you popped open the magnetic bottom of them, uh, there was a high probability that the actual antenna feed line was not actually connected to the antenna itself. So when people will plug it in, like, I don't see anything except for noise and clocks or whatever, and it was because the physical interface was disconnected. There's other things to consider as well, uh, some uh, things that would become readily apparent to you if you got a ham radio operator's license, so I strongly suggest that you consider that if you haven't before, but things along the lines of harmonics to attenuation to a mismatched antenna system. Uh, and more importantly, grounding noise and static. And every single time I've, I've watched the Reddit threads of RTL SDR, like, what's this signal? And I see a lot of other forums where it's like, what's this signal? And a lot of the times it comes back to these last few points where there's either a bad grounding issue or there's some noise from a clock source that's on there. It could be a random harmonic that comes up there or just general static uh, and static-based discharges that just causes a spike uh, in your interface. So what I uh, promote to people is to read uh, these various resources. There's two of them there. Um, you can search these terms and find these free publications that talk about uh, how to properly build a radio receiving station. And this is a ham radio 101 sort of thing. Like if you've ever built a ham shack, you need to make sure that your grounds are good and you have lightning suppression because lightning wants to be your friend. Don't be lightning's friend. We'll get to that in a moment. But the Navy put out a RFI handbook that is absolutely uh, fantastic because it also comes with some really poignant and direct examples, such as common noise sources. Just, a, just one sec. Sure. We'll, we'll upload the slides somewhere afterwards for everyone who failed to get a picture of those URLs. And yeah. I'll, I'll we'll, make a tweet on the Twitter account for yeah, the uh, we'll, Wireless Village. We'll put it up somewhere so that you can get hold of this information. So uh, one of the more common ones is the actual computer that you're using to observe the signals from. So who has a power supply on the computer that kind of looks like this, where you have a metal case and then the power plug itself is a plastic plug? That's a noise source. That plug should actually be metal uh, in order to make sure that all your grounds are tied together. Uh, this is called BFG, not like in the game Quake. Uh, it's a barrier feed and ground. Um, and the other component uh, for people who build ham shacks and such, uh, they don't typically pay attention to the problems associated with mismatched metals. So you have a ground rod outside, uh, copper or uh, steel, I've seen zinc as well, and people mismatch the metal types. And what you end up having over a period of time is, well, weather gets to it, starts to rust, starts to fall apart. And this is a great picture uh, of a grounding rod at a cell phone tower site that was throwing all kinds of wonky harmonics and noise just from that, everything else about the radio equipment was fine and functional. It was the ground to the earth ground that a little bit of water and weather got into and separated the cap, and it turned out that they had mismatched metals that created some rust and that particular fracture. So you got to pay attention to some really interesting details, and it typically always comes back to uh, your physical capture source, your physical layer. As I mentioned, lightning wants to be your friend. Do not be lightning's friend. Proper ground suppression for lightning strikes for any long-term equipment that you're going to put in is absolutely critical for the safety of yourself as well as everyone around you. Uh, to your left is the uh, ethernet cable for a Wi-Fi antenna uh, for a system that I managed that got struck by lightning. The radio system survived and the suppression system uh, took the brunt of the um, strike, uh, but it turned that ethernet cable into this small little brittle twig. And when I went back to replace everything, it snapped. It was kind of freaky. To the right is a picture shared uh, to me from 
a couple of days ago from a friend of ours whose house got struck by lightning and had catastrophic severe damage to their house. They are still, they're not, they haven't lived in their house for a couple of months because they're still having to uh, replace and repair all the wiring damage associated uh, with a lightning strike to the house. So lightning may find you, it may not find you. If it does find you, be ready for it, is ultimately what I'm uh, trying to get at. So when a lightning strike comes down, you have these feelers that come up. A strike that can happen a mile away from you can create so much energy inside the wiring infrastructure in your house as well as your radio systems systems that it can cause damage and still be life-threatening. So you still need to be very, very careful with your grounding systems and infrastructure when it comes to uh, Thor and his angry farts. All right. Let's, uh, do you want to swap microphones? Oh. I spat on it, so okay. That was... <laughs> um... All right, so we're going we're gonna to look at some signals. You've, you've set up your SDR, you've set up your receiver, you've uh, been, been kind of uh, pulling, down, pulling down data, you've been looking at spectrum plots, waterfalls, whatever. So the first question is, is it Wi-Fi? Are you absolutely sure it's not Wi-Fi? Are you sure it's not Bluetooth? Are you really sure? How about something else that's really, really common in homes? Smart meters, weather stations, some of the, are you absolutely sure it's none of those things that someone else has already reverse engineered so that you don't have to do it? Go back through this list a second time and make sure, specifically like point number seven, are you sure you're the first person trying to reverse engineer this? Uh, and, and this happens to us all. Mike Osman and I reverse engineered the control protocol for some tiny little, um, like, $10, $15 quadcopters a couple of years ago. And as we were doing that, we um, looked up the, uh, um, we looked up the, uh, like a, a code from the packet, like a, a whitening sequence. And we Googled it to see if it was common for a given radio system. And we found a project where uh, some people had already reverse engineered that very um, system. So we, we managed to find someone else who'd already done this thing. We'd Googled the name of the system. We'd looked up like various other details about it. But as soon as we put in like a 10 bytes of hex string, it was a unique enough search term that we just found their code. And they were kind of halfway through the project and we were halfway through the project and we were able to combine our efforts and, and we managed to publish a spec for them to go and implement it. But, but there's, it's really likely that somewhere, someone on GitHub has like some half-assed code to do the thing that you're trying to do. But let's assume that you have found something unusual. You've bought a new device specifically for this. Um, someone's built a transmitter. Someone you're taking part in a wireless CTF. Um, huh. There we go. So you're did looking you at what? Two by chance. Did I did I jump two slides? Nope, uh, never mind. No, Sorry. I thought I had yeah. as well. Um, let Let's start to look at how we identify things. What we're looking at in the in the plot. What What frequency are we on right now? Someone shout it out. Who was that? All right, don't lose an eye. <laughs> Did you just throw a piece of plastic at them? Yeah, the ass just gone. Oh, okay, yep, <laughs> piece of plastic. It's a black badge. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a black badge to a con that you gotta find. Um, <laughs> so this is at two, uh, 2.4 gigahertz, and, and like, this is one of those screenshots from that document, and so obviously I've been told repeatedly this is not Wi-Fi, but if you look at that little yellow dip in the middle of the bright red horizontal lines, that's really common in Wi-Fi. What, what happens when you look at a, a waterfall plot of Wi-Fi is it's 20 megahertz wide, it is high powered, and in the middle there is a little dip in power. This is really common for, well, for OFDM Wi-Fi, OFDM. which is pretty much anything you're gonna be seeing these days. Um, and that's really common, and it, but also you, you can use that little dip in the middle to work out where the center of it is. And the center of it is at about 2412 megahertz, which is the middle of a Wi-Fi channel. It's 2.4 gigahertz, it's noisy, it's high powered, it's a, anyway. It's the, bursty. It is definitely Wi-Fi. Uh, but that's not Wi-Fi, Dominic, that's not Wi-Fi. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, that's not so, Wi-Fi. So our next one, uh, also from the same document. What you'll note is, oh, Note on this one, your gain stages are set too high. It is, like, you are, you're getting less information out of that waterfall because you cannot differentiate between uh, noisy and, and uh, 
quiet signals. Right. It's everyone everyone loud. searches for more and more and more dynamic range, and then they get their gain settings incorrect and completely destroy their ability to differentiate between loud and quiet signals. So play around with your gain settings, make it look a little bit more like this one. In this one, this guy actually got his gain settings quite right. Uh, maybe a little low, but, but they're fine. And you can see those big, wide, wide things across. Uh, hopefully, you might be able to see my cursor. There are some very wide. And a permission request in that screenshot. That's the first time I noticed that. that oh, yeah, yeah. That's not, that's like, not my laptop. That is like Johnny just, Long's no tech hacking thing is like yeah. triggering in my head right now. So, so, but these very wide, wideband things, they're also Wi Fi. It's not Wi Fi. But if you see these little, these little ones, these little shorter, uh, like narrow ones, very quick packets all over the place, that's Bluetooth. I told you it's not Wi Fi. <laughs> that is Bluetooth. And I can tell you categorically that's Bluetooth. That's, I mean, it's, it looks like Bluetooth. It hops around like Bluetooth. I've spent so long looking at Bluetooth signals in these, <laughs> in these things. That's, that's a Bluetooth signal. Don't bother trying to reverse it. I mean, feel free. They, they have a feel group meeting on Wednesdays it, for people yeah. who have uh, dealt with Bluetooth so long like Dominic. But, but it's, not, uh, it's not something unusual that you need to go and reverse engineer. You need to go to, to Bluetooth.org, download the spec, and read the spec of how it's put together and if you want to reverse engineer it. Don't try and reverse engineer a thing like that. Uh, and I know because that's where my master's thesis came from. Um, this one. This <laughs> That's not Wi-Fi. Uh, there's a small parade of mobility scooters, and I'm pretty sure they're here for me. Oh, geez. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> champ. Um, Oakley, Doakley. Thank anyway, you so so this uh, this screenshot is the the person put this in to uh, to claim. I think this is how Bitcoin works. How how stuck up ah How stuck on the stage are you? Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna keep going. Um, Welcome to DEF CON folks. Everyone stay frosty. I do you know the worst the worst frosty. thing <laughs> The worst thing is like this is really solid now. This is shaken up. So uh, this is getting thrown No no the one on the floor is yeah. getting winged. So this one's getting thrown out to whoever gets the next question, right? Um, uh, okay. So so this was this shake was your beer, not a baby. This. <laughs> wow, this is. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, so this is this is, was sent to us as part of that same 51-page report, and they said, this is this is a microwave oven, and they're probably not wrong that it is a microwave oven. But I can tell you from the screenshot, someone has grabbed the frequency slider and just been wiggling it around. Because these are, they, like, this is not a radio system. Yeah, it's like, like someone they don't just do this. took it's the tuner efficient. and went back and forth, back just, and forth. Yeah, or they've been wiggling their antenna around, moving it around. Yeah, so, something's so, moving. <laughs> yeah, something is moving around. Like, it is really obvious from all of these screenshots that this person is, like, either unsure of what they're looking at or actively lying to us. Now, it's the, not Wi-Fi. The problem is this individual chose both paths. They chose to, <laughs> they chose to be unsure about what they were looking at, but be so overconfident about what they were looking at that, that they actively lied, lied to us when they were asking for help. So if you see something like this, think about what might be causing it. Have you just been playing with the game stages? Have you just been playing with the tuner? Let it settle for a bit. Is this radio system something that's, that's periodic? Is this radio system something that's caused because you just put a bag of popcorn in the microwave? Is this... Have you all heard of this guy named Nikola Tesla? He made all, all these kind of crazy things, and one of them was like a ghost voice box uh, sort of a, a passive uh, radio system. When you put your hand near it, it would get, uh, make different sounds and all that stuff, and it would pick, other, pick up other atmospheric uh, radio conditions as well. Well, if you mess with your gain settings incorrectly and you put your hand right up near the antenna, you can also just as easily see something like that. So if your laptop's in your lap and your dongle is off to your lap, um, the, uh, uh, what you may end up uh, seeing just from like shifting yourself a little bit is some variance in uh, amplitude in some of the signals that come by or even some frequency offsets that uh, kick around because you are a body of water, last I knew. Oh yeah, especially at 2.4 gigahertz. I mean, uh, so our friend, uh, our friend Dragon, uh, 
sets up Wi-Fi networks for, for various cons, and he, he talks about how the Wi-Fi works perfectly until the people arrive, uh, and he refers to them as big Wi-Fi absorbing sacks of meat. And like it, you are going to throw off 2.4 gigahertz. I mean, there's a reason it's not a chunk of the frequency spectrum that the FCC and various other organizations organizations around the world want to charge people extortionate amounts for licenses in because it's terrible. Uh, that's why we get to use it for Wi-Fi, but the unlicensed bands are awesome because we get to do amazing things amazing. with them. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. How are we doing for time? Uh, we're a quarter of the way in. Oh, well, we're not a quarter of the way into the slides. No, but we'll uh, run through them. Okay. <laughs> uh, so if, if you definitely, definitely want to reverse engineer signals, like if we've got to the point where I've convinced you that you know what Wi-Fi looks like, and you know what Bluetooth looks like, and you know what a microwave oven looks like, and FM broadcast radio, and all these things, then we're at the point where we need to start looking at the tools we can use. So $20, you can pick up an RTL SDR dongle. Uh, almost anyone here will show you how to, to use it. Uh, if you want a bit more high performance SDR, you've got Hacker F1, Blader F, USRP, uh, if you want a radio dongle that's not an SDR, so you don't have to think about that messy analog section, Yardstick 1, RF Cat, there are various radio dongles. There's a Crazy Fly radio dongle for 2.4 yeah. gigahertz. Sometimes uh, hacker uh, con badges can be modified to do it as well. Yeah. Oh, there's an Uber Tooth. Yeah. I, I should remember that one because I work on it. <laughs> I think um, you deleted that. Oh, yeah, I probably did. <laughs> um, and then on the right hand side of this slide, we've got some tools, um, various different different tools for looking at signals either in real time or offline um, for identifying signals. There are the two URLs. FCC.io is a little uh, hacky script thing I wrote once. Um, if you want to see horrible JavaScript, look at how it's written. Um, but it, it allows you to take the FCC ID you find on the back of a device. FCC.io forward slash that FCC ID will show you the FCC filings for that, that device. So immediately you will know what frequency it's on Probably, if you read the test report, what uh, its bandwidth is, or what its modulation method is, or any of that sort of stuff. And SIGID Wiki is a group of people who put together signals on a wiki and identify them. And they say, I found this at 4.3 gigahertz. It's this wide. Here's a screenshot. Here's a capture, whatever. There's an audio sample. Yeah, yeah. they have a and waterfall screenshot of it. And if they go as far as identifying where it is and where they've observed it from. Um, it's a very powerful resource. So if you're just like looking for something, you could go there first to see if anyone else has seen the exact same thing, which is going to save you a ton of effort. And, and this is also goes back to that, are you sure someone hasn't tried to reverse engineer it before you? And maybe if you find it on there, you'll find someone else who's got a little bit further than you, or they've got some ideas, or they've got a better capture than you have, or they, you know, they had a cleaner capture, or they have had ideas, or they can say, well, I saw it in the US, but I, no one's ever seen it outside of the US. OK, well, maybe it's something that's licensed within the United States, or, right. or so on and so forth. So, um, Yeah, uh, so like an example of some of the software decoders that are out there, uh, everyone has seen the program RTL 433. Uh, you have this be number better in your head than I do, but how many different devices has it uh, got so, in it approximately? So RTL 433, I actually looked this up about 15 minutes ago. If you look at their GitHub page, RTL 433 has decoders built into it for 107 different devices. Uh, tire pressure sensors, uh, remote keyless entry systems for cars, weather stations, X10 home automation, and other home automation, temperature sensors. So you have, um, you know, a, wireless thermostat in your house that connects back to your boiler. That thing's probably using 433 megahertz if it's, if it's older and Wi-Fi if it's modern. Right. And so depending on you know, who you get it from. So there's a fair chance this thing already understands it. Uh, smart meters, these sorts of things. It, it has code in, in there for a whole bunch of these things. And there's a fair chance if someone implements a radio system, if I'm, if I'm building a temperature sensor that I want to be wireless, I'm not going to invent my own radio protocol. I'm going to buy an off-the-shelf RF solution. And therefore, it's probably going to be an almost identical packet format to something that RTL 40, 433 already supports. So you may not, no one may have reverse engineered the thing you're trying to reverse, reverse engineer before, but they, they may have reverse engineered something with an almost identical packet format or identical or near or similar style of communication, same modulation, same checksum, all that sort of thing. And you don't have to worry about that stuff. You've just got to find something that RTL 433 supports and, and then just modify it. Um, and then the, the other stuff on the other side is uh, 
RTL FM, uh, which is an FM broadcast decoder for it. There's like analyzers to get those waterfall plots. There's software out there. I mean, rtlsdr.com has a list of software that supports the RTLSDR dongle. And it is huge. And there's stuff to do with satellites, weather satellites, as I put on screen. Um, there's stuff to do with uh, there's, there's tools for uh, aircraft location, ADSB. Oh, yeah. ADSB, and, yeah. yep, yep, yep. All that stuff. So if you, if you step up from an RT, so, so you can do that for 20 bucks. 20 bucks and all that, everything we talked about was free software. You can just go download it. And it's a good test to just start with to see if that thing hasn't been uh, reversed already for yourself. It's right. a no effort sort of uh, first step. Yeah, actually, I don't know that we mentioned this at the start. I work for uh, uh, one of the, I work for Great Scott Gadgets who manufacture the Hack RF. Um, but I would generally prefer, if you're unsure about which SDR to buy, you should buy the $20 RTL SDR and work out what you need. Because until you know whether you need a wide frequency range, whether you need high dynamic range, whether you need... High sampling. High sampling rate, uh, transmit uh, and receive, or just receive. Until you can work out what it is you want from an SDR, um, I don't want you to come and buy... I don't necessarily always want you to come and buy our product. I mean, I'd love you all to buy our product. <laughs> but I don't necessarily do want you to buy our product if it's, if it's wrong for you, because it actually doesn't gain you anything in terms of achieving what you want to achieve. Um, so... And so I changed the slide to be general SDR rather than say hacker F. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> but, but you can use GNU Radio. And loads and loads of people have written really cool tools for GNU Radio. And they wrote them with like really powerful, expensive SDRs years ago. And now you get to pick up a, a like $300 SDR and you get to implement like a pager system, an entire pager network, or like GSM systems on a, on a Blade RF. Right. Things like this, you can implement it, and it's, again, it's software you can go and download. Um, Pi Bombs for GNU Radio has a huge number of packages in it that that mostly just work out of the box with a fair amount of reading, a lot of documentation, yeah. a lot of reading, a lot of reading. Yeah. Um, the other thing is like Osmocom FFT. Uh, it's even better with Phosphor mode. It's even better if you then record the captures from there and open them up in Inspectrum. Hey, Mike. Hi, Mike. Don't worry, you get mentioned again. In a minute. Oh, yeah. Don't go anywhere. Uh, do you want to do Universal Radio yeah. Hacker? So Universal Radio Hacker is a tool that I've used a couple of times in order to uh, start working on, like, I've got a sample of stuff and I want to start looking at it. You know, there's a lot of documentation out there that says, hey, store it as a wave file uh, and, you know, open it up in Audacity and then pull out a ruler and put scotch, uh, scotch tape on your display. Bleah. Anyways, uh, Universal Radio Hacker uh, has really uh, broken down the process for me into the main three steps in one tool, which is fantastic. And your three steps are, uh, you gotta be able to uh, uh, get that signal in and start figuring out what the different types of waveforms you're dealing with. Uh, are you dealing with Manchester encoding? And if you are, um, it's gonna be fun. Uh, but then once you start getting that byte stream uh, or bit stream out, uh, being able to turn that bitstream into meaningful data, you can still do it inside that same tool. And if you are working with a system in which you're uh, lawfully able to communicate with, you're able to then generate uh, uh, generate data back in order to test to make sure that what it is you're working on is actually really and truly working. It has taken, uh, I'm, I remember getting into this uh, stuff many, many years ago, and um, one of the tools that I used was Bodline. And this tool uh, was suggested uh, by many, many uh, folks. And Bodline is an interesting, you know, first-time experience. It's like uh, uh, being a three-year-old and getting on a mountain bike for the first time and your parents saying, go, and uh, shoving you downhill. I have a very dark childhood. Anyways, uh, the, um, the first time I used it, uh, I, I figured out how to start navigating the tool and pulling the data in, and I'll show you in a minute for, as a refresher. But uh, I, I was talking to Mike Osman uh, before uh, Gray Scott Gadgets with the Hack RF started getting really, really crazy. It was back with the Jawbreaker. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, I was looking at my alarm system, like, what am I looking at? And uh, started going through the exact same experience that we're sharing with you as to how we got to figure out what we're doing. So Bodline, it's useful. I still use it. Um, the, the thing about it is that it has quirks. And I'm, the, I, I've never updated. Uh, I'm told it has a greater than 50 meg capacity. Anyone correct me? Say yes, no. Is it true? Is, 
Okay, beta version does work better. So I don't have the beta version. So what I do is I still take the uh, capture file and use DD to break it up into 50 megabyte segments because it won't process anything beyond that, um, and at least the version that I have. And, uh, and the example that I have for you is already quite small, so uh, the other things that you have to do with it is uh, make sure that you select uh, quadrature. Uh, it's two channels because you got your uh, INQ uh, components to it, and it's an 8-bit unsigned uh, uh, integer, uh, data stream. And then when you open it up, you get this uh, as a screenshot for your 50 meg uh, sample. And clicking on it is a little funny, you'll get used to that. Um, it, but this is a fantastic screenshot of a nuke signal uh, from a, a car keychain. And as you zoom in, the old way of doing it was to, you know, take that and put your laptop on the side or take a screenshot and rotate the image and, you know, pull out some graph paper <laughs> or, uh, uh, you know, some other really, really painful things. So I really recommend using um, other tools, but it's still a very useful one to be able to use uh, in order to try to determine where uh, certain nuances are with the signal if the other ones are kind of being a little bit difficult with you. And some of those nuances can be uh, the clear start and end of a uh, transmission for certain things, um, and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, so so for a while we were talking about the shortcomings of Boardline. Um, oh wait, we swap in. I'm actually gonna need my hands in a second, so I'm gonna have, wow, that was smooth. Okay. This is, I, I don't know if anyone saw me speak yesterday, but at some point someone else had to use me as a mic stand. I'm good. Thank uh, you. You'll hold it for now? Uh, yeah, I'll hold, it, I'll hold it for the moment. I'll see you um, later in the men's room. So uh, in, Spectrum, in Spectrum was a tool written uh, kind of uh, to address some of the shortcomings in Boardline. It is free and open source. Uh, it was written by Mike Walters. I mean, you come, can see come it. Come on, Mike, stand up. Yeah. 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 Thank you, sir. And, and so, so for years and years, everyone in the wireless village has done that sort of thing to me and everyone else who's ever written any software. And it's just really nice to be able to do it to Mike because he's actually, he's a lovely, lovely guy, but he's also a little bit shy about this. Uh, so you should go to him later and uh, ask him all about Inspectrum. Give him a hug. He's actually, he's happy to talk about, <laughs> I'm saying this because I genuinely believe it's true, but he's happy to talk about it and, uh, and things like that. Also, uh, if you have, Issues with it, raise them on GitHub. Oh, wait. I'm oh, going to do a live demo of this. Yep, live demo. All right. This is, this is going to be quick. This is how to reverse engineer something within Spectrum. Realistically, this is the bit of the talk that you might care about most if once you're done with all our ranting about someone else has already done this before you. So you can hold that for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is a capture file I took uh, from GNU RadioCon last year where there was this wireless CTF. Uh, it's a capture of a pager. We have to lean closer to the screen in a minute. So, so I've loaded it up in Inspectrum. Uh, unlike Boardline, uh, which were, um, Russ was saying, you have to kind of turn your laptop on the side to get it the way around you want. This thing puts frequency on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis, which is, yeah, turns out handy. Uh, somewhere, wow, I am struggling. Wow. <laughs> Actually unnerving, mate. Uh, OK, all right. Here is some data. This looks really promising. It's bright, brightly colored data in a kind of sea of, sea of kind of background noise. Um, I can play with my power settings on the side so that it kind of pops out nicely and we get rid of some of the blur around the edges because radio transmitters aren't like cheap radio transmitters and, and this thing is the cheapest of the cheap radio transmitters. I mean, you can buy this thing on Amazon but it is not FCC certified. Um, uh, it is, and, and I took it apart, and it's, it's not great. Um, but, but so you want to you kind of get rid of, I don't know why I'm pointing at my screens if you can see it. Um, you you want to kind okay. of diminish some of these, these lobes a bit by, by turning up the max power. And this should be fine. And then what we should be able to do is add a derived plot. It's an amplitude plot. Pull it down to the center frequency. Tune this in a little bit. And come scroll all the way down to the bottom here because it appears beneath it. Well, that's... There it goes. There it goes. That looks much better. That does not look that much better. Why did this work when we tested it five minutes ago and not now? Because it uh, didn't sacrifice anything. Okay. 
Uh, amplitude plot. No, that is what I added. Hey, Mike, Mike. I'm, using your, I'm using your tool wrong, and I feel bad about this because you and I, you sat me down and taught me how to do this a minute ago. Anyway, so I, I've got this derived plot at the bottom, and this is the amplitude of the signal, and it just looks significantly worse than it did 10 minutes ago. Um, but it will still work. Let's add cursors. And you know that, that looks like it's a thing, so let's add some more cursors. And it's not quite lining up, so it's, I've probably got my cursor width wrong. So let's assume it's a bit more narrow. Oh, that looks good. That looks, well, if I could use a mouse, that look good. Sorry, hold your mic. There you go. All right, so what I've done is I've lined up a lot of these, these vertical lines in here with the, with the symbols at the bottom. And then I can just keep increasing my number of cursors and seeing if it, li say, it lines up with the transitions every time. That means I've probably found where we change between ones and zeros, where we switch bits in this signal. And I can just keep going. Oh, I wish I hadn't done that. There you go. There we go. I can just keep going. And it, and it kind of keeps going. You can, once you get a bit, a bit further into it, you can kind of adjust it so it's a bit more correct across the whole thing. And that looks pretty good. So what I can now do is I can, I can right click on this again and I can add a threshold plot. And all that does is it says, we'll, we'll set a minimum value, we'll set a value and we'll threshold it to, to binary, one or zero. And yeah, because I screwed up the power settings. There, there we, go. we go. God, I am not good at computers. Um, there we go. Okay, so what, what we've ended up with here is, if I go over this way, we've got uh, an amplitude plot, and then at the bottom we've got a binary plot. And that looks very similar to the amplitude plot because we've got such a clean signal. But really, it's just the threshold of the amplitude plot anyway. And then I right click on this one more time, and I do extract symbols to stand it out, and I minimize this. And what you'll notice on the screen right here, I've got, uh, wow, here. What a, what, Make it bigger. Oh, I don't remember how to do this. In there you go. What you'll notice is it dumped the binary of those symbols, cutting it at the cursor points to uh, stand it out. So I've gone from a signal that was just an arbitrary capture that I, I grabbed, and in a couple of minutes, I've got binary output for one of the packets. Now I can repeat that for every packet that I find in that file. I can look to see if they're the same, if it's repeating transmissions, if it's modifying, if it's changing them. I can look to see if there are code numbers. Does it look like, if we have different transmissions over time, does it look like they've got different CRCs at a section? So a lot of analysis I can do when I get, once I get to bits, but I'm no longer worrying about radio. At this point, all I'm looking at is packet data. And this was a, a pager system, and there was a number written on the pager, and I was able to just pull that out of the appropriate field in the binary, modify it, retransmit, and make one of the other pages buzz. Um, and that one points in the CTF. And it was a super simple, um, it was a super simple challenge once you knew how to use the tools. But I mean, I've just gone through it in, what, two or three, three minutes. minutes? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it probably took me a couple of hours to get it right and to make sure that I was receiving the right thing and spent some time you know, receiving Wi-Fi and, and all sorts of other things. But it, once you learn how to use the tools, that's an, that's an SDR challenge that you might find in a wireless CTF or that's something you might find when you buy a device. And it takes, it takes minutes with a tool like Inspectrum. So it's a fantastic piece of software um, and I highly recommend it. Wait, which one of these is actually, there we, there we go. All right, uh, the rest of this is mostly you, mate. Yep, you oh. got that. And then what we do is we take the same data. We take, so now we know, I've received it, right? So I, I know what frequency it was on. Um, I've, I've determined that it was amplitude modulated. If it had been frequency modulated, I just would have seen two levels in that, in that plot. And I could have just done exactly the same thing, but applied an, a derived plot for frequency modulation. Um, so it, it, and you can eyeball it. You don't even, there's no, there's no kind of magic automated method for determining what it is. You just eyeball that and you learn it over time by analyzing more and more samples. I get, I get the data rate out of it. If I tab over to Inspectrum, at the side here, I have my symbol period, I have my data rate, I have my bit period, and I can use that to then program, damn it. I can use that to program a, a dongle. This is the yardstick one, this is RFCAT, this is the yardstick one um, transmission code. And so 
or receiving code, sorry. And so this will just configure those values I've just determined from Inspectrum into the yardstick one dongle. I will then use that, use that, like set that going. I will leave that Python script running, and it will just dump every packet it sees to the screen for me. I've just automated the process that I took three minutes to complete manually, and it's just going to happen for me, and, and it's going to dump those things to the screen. And it is this, this is it. This is all the Python code in that file. Like this is all you need. Set the well, I guess there's an include at the top, um, but set the set the values of the into the modem for what you're trying to receive, and then it will just give them to you. And at that point, you can leave it running overnight as people play around with this thing, or whenever you need to, come back to it and do your analysis on it later. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Yeah, but sometimes you want to do even more with it after that. Sometimes you want to potentially keep track of devices that are coming on, coming Here around you. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, Russ is going to talk to you about that. So there was a, uh, in, in the wonderful world uh, that is inside my head, in the dark creature corners of fun bags and unicorns, there a project uh, came um, uh, out of my head that I started a couple of years ago, and I call it Soho Sigint. And uh, the purpose of it was, is my wife and I had just moved to a new house. It's pretty far back in the property line, and I wanted to know who and what was coming up in my property uh, to ascertain whether or not I needed to put pants on or not. And if my mother-in-law was coming uh, the, uh, to visit, then pants off, um, so on and so forth. So the, the purpose of it was to start off with Wi-Fi. And this is during the time period in which uh, devices, when they uh, probed for wireless networks, they would still mostly use their true MAC address. So some of this still works, but isn't entirely true. But the wireless uh, network IDs that are there that they are probing for over and over and over can still be used to be unique enough in order to determine whose device it is if you know who is physically at your house. The other cool thing that I eventually added to it over time was some Bluetooth stuff, some TPMS stuff. I'm working on a mass and alternator uh, thing with uh, RTL SDRs. And what it's now allowed me to determine is uh, not just who is coming, but even mail services. Like, did FedEx just show up? Is it the same FedEx guy? That's not creepy. Uh, so my wife, uh, Beth made me build in a time period in which this information would decay just from organic uh, capture until I flagged it as someone who I wanted to track and identify, and that part is important in a moment. So it's, uh, no, the term is based, based upon two words, so host, small home, small office, signals intelligence, and uh, I built it on a budget, and with that ref, uh, resource that we had mentioned earlier uh, with the SIGID uh, wiki, that was very, very important for me to be able to use in order to help uh, interpret some of the signals that I was getting from the RTL SDR to determine whether or not it was worth my time to put in to try to record that particular um, uh, you know, transmission. First steps first, you got to collect your baseline of everything that you have going around you. This is some of the uh, things about the antenna farm that I have in uh, my attic and garage and other uh, places. Uh, I have the uh, festive collinear co coaxial antenna on your um, right. And uh, that used to live in a window for a long time. And Beth said, get that out of here. And I said, but it's festive. And uh, I lost that argument. So the... Um, I finally got a rudimentary system in place that was uh, doing Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and a little bit of uh, TPMS, and it was really, really uh, interesting for a couple of reasons. From uh, the Bluetooth side, I had no idea there were so many Tickle Me Elmos in my neighborhood, uh, and uh, that was fun. Uh, the other thing was when Halloween came around, I noticed that uh, I had a lot of neighbors who had their SSIDs of their home address. Well, so, you know, you think about it, uh, you set your SSID of your home address. Well, is that your home? Well, it's, we know your address. But now I know it's you with your device and where you live based upon uh, the network that you're probing for. So I turned that into an entity. Uh, I was tracking a neighbor whose dog was defecating in our yard. Um, so that was a, a fun interaction. But what was really important was um, a problem that my neighbors were having. And they were noticing, uh, so I live in one of those neighborhoods where people leave their 
cars unlocked and their houses unlocked. And I was like, I won't be the lower hanging fruit. I'm obviously not the lower hanging fruit, uh, but they are. And that's a lifestyle. And I'm not going to try to argue or change that. But they were noticing that they would have anything from like 50 cents to what ultimately ended up being $180 overnight stolen from the car. They leave their wallet, their phone, their laptops and all that sort of stuff. And what I later uh, determined out of it was that criminals know that when things are stolen that are electronic, they can be disabled and tracked. But cash is king. And we had the question of like, you know, did you talk to your kids? Do you need to have the scare talk with your kids? Are your kids stealing? I think it's your kids. It's not Wi-Fi. Uh, so anyways, uh, I, I created Operation Catch the Fucker. And uh, originally it was just let's stand up a uh, surveillance camera. Uh, I do a lot of hunting. So people, when they work uh, at night, they kind of act like deer in some regards. So I set up a camera, had to move his car over in the driveway, and I put some blind spots in the area so the guy would, uh, uh, when, uh, at the time I didn't know it was a guy, but when he came through, uh, he would you know, feel that it was a little bit more comfortable to hit the car. Well, I set the camera up on like a, a Friday evening, and um, well, he showed up that evening. And uh, this is not the identifying photo. Uh, there's better ones of him. But he's coming up to the car, and he's like, got a flashlight in his hand that you see, but he's like strobing it because he now sees this thing uh, there that he d hasn't seen before. And in the first day, we got him on the car, uh, like coming up to the car and looking at it. And I thought, that was kind of cool. So we showed it to the detectives. They recognized who he was because he was a frequent customer. And the, uh, during the interview process, uh, I suggested to the detectives that uh, you get a warrant for the phone to get the uh, Bluetooth and MAC address uh, off of the phone because I happen to have this weird data set that I've been running for like over a year and it's totally not creepy, it's fine. Um, and uh, let's see what happens. And they go, okay, well the guy consented, they didn't need a warrant. And Sure enough, uh, he gave me the MAC address, I ran it in the data set and ding, I got hits every single night that there was a reported theft uh, in my neighborhood. And um, that was awesome. I was like, this, this thing augmented my normal surveillance camera system. Uh, so that, that was cool. And I was, uh, also the, the purpose of the project for me was to get back into writing uh, packet decoders and uh, sniffers and C and all that stuff. And Dragorn, this was the other thing that uh, Dominic and I were reflecting upon. It was like, there's a lot of mics who work in the radio space. Uh, there's Mike Kershaw, Mike Osman. <laughs> it just keeps going on and on and on. So anyone know what Mike Osman looks like? Mike Osman? Not Osman, sorry. Okay, uh, Dragorn, Mike Kershaw. All right, uh, only one person. This is old man Wi-Fi. And old man Wi-Fi, uh, a couple years ago, and I were talking about my project and that I had written a whole web UI to it and you know databasing system. And then he reached out to me and goes, I may have killed your project by revamping all of Kismet and a new data aggregation service and functionality with a web UI, which is awesome. I'm okay with this. Uh, been working with him on suggestions and we you know, all uh, put code in, but Mike is awesome. Uh, that's his uh, Patreon. Please, you, uh, if you never get a chance to see him, at least support his uh, beer fund uh, by uh, uh, signing up for that. All right, so Kismet RC1, I believe, just went out. Uh, yeah, like last week, he put out a release candidate for this new version. It's a complete rewrite, or mostly rewrite. It's, it's got a web UI now instead of that, that command line. And curses. curses UI. Yeah. Um, it's a bunch of... <laughs> It's got a whole yeah, bunch was, of uh, yeah, nonsense. Trying... Yeah, oh, it's... Oh, uh... goodness. <laughs> Come on. It's okay. So, yeah, it, but it's really, really fantastic because now uh, you can run it on any kind of hardware. So, like, the, the demonstration over there is running on a Raspberry Pi Zero that is monitoring everything in this room in a way that you can just plug it into a device without actually having to configure it, and you just type in kismet.local, and you're off to the races. But there's also some other things about kismet. Uh, in conversation uh, with the Soho SIGINT stuff. And uh, I haven't totally started putting in sensor code into it yet because, you know, time, money, energy, and sleep. And uh, it wasn't until recently that I reached out to Mike and said, hey, just how hard is it to, you know, I have a thing. I want Kismet to ingest that thing. Uh, I, I saw that you're doing RTL 433 with it and all these other sort of uh, projects saying, 
It's like, I, 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 and I see that you're wrapping it, wrapping it in Python and just firing it at it. He's like, that looks awesome and easy. He goes, nope. So we're going to kind of step through that process as to why it's a nope, but it makes a lot of sense. So the other modules that are in there that you may not necessarily know are things about Zigbee. There's RTL 433, so those like 109-ish, 107-ish other devices, uh, weather stations and all that stuff are going to be ingested in Kismet. Uh, UAV drone systems are in there. Uh, there's Z-Wave. Um, and that, that's just what, what's there right now. Just, you know, pull it down out of Git, compile it, you're easy, uh, easy and good to go. The other thing that Mike wanted to relate to everyone is that uh, he is a writer a fantastic writer, a fantastic documenter of his code and instructions. And the link on the bottom is uh, the link to um, uh, the developer source information that explains all the different data types that you could ever want to know about it in great detail. And some folks will say, hey, just look at the code. There's your example. He provides additional examples inside of it as well. It's just the guy is overly thoughtful in a very good way for everyone to be able to pick it up and run with it. So you should. Yeah, yeah having developed code for Kismet before uh, for, for the Ubertooth project. Sorry, I've gone for a more yeah. casual, relaxed stance. <laughs> um, so uh, having, having, <laughs> having developed uh, Kismet co uh, code for the Ubertooth project historically, it's really, really easy with his documentation and things. So like, don't be, if, if you do get to the stage where you are you, you found something that you want to monitor, you think Kismet might be a great back end to monitor this thing, and, and you need to get your code into it. Like, don't be afraid of, of adding code to Kismet. It's super straightforward with his uh, kind of help and documentation. So with that, oop, writing code for Kismet is, uh, for the next few slides, is going to be a little bit like how you draw this damn owl. Uh, you know, you draw two concentric circles, and the next thing you know, you got a freaking owl uh, staring you in the face. Uh, but there's some things I'm going to talk to you about that are the important things to consider. The code's already there for, and the documentation's already there for you to be able to fill in the blanks with, but these are the parallels and the things to consider when you decide to go into writing your own sensors and telemetry. So the background, for, the importance of me uh, doing this is that for the Wireless Village, hopefully by ShmooCon, I'll have an electronic badge either finished in its prototyping or available where you'll be able to play most of our CTF from the badge for both Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and software-defined radio. So that's my goal. Don't hold me to it. So first step, you have to define a physical interface. You have to define a physical layer. Kismet doesn't know what you're giving it. And it's written in C++. So you're going to have to define some things so it can ingest that data and know where to uh, take the square peg and all that sort of stuff. And once you've, uh, you know, mentally got that construct around your head, the next few step, uh, steps start um, uh, falling into place. The other thing that is absolutely important is to take a look at the demo code for dealing with tracking of the packets as they're coming in and tracking of the devices. This is easily done. It's just a couple of lines of code that you can just copy and paste and rename to fit for the device that you're looking to try to monitor. But those are absolutely uh, critical in order for Kismet to know what has just uh, been given to it so it knows where to put those various bits of uh, data. Step two. Uh, oh, wait, sorry, I got ahead of myself. So uh, thoughts for the constructs uh, in C++. So when I was like, you know, you have a byte stream, uh, and Kismet doesn't know what to do with that. Uh, if you've ever written a packet sniffer before in C, uh, you may uh, remember libpcap, and you have uh, the struct for a packet. All right, I just got a packet. What part of the packet is the IP address? Is this uh, TCP or UDP? And then, uh, well, you have those variously, uh, various defined structs. Same sort of concept. So on the right of the screen is the radio tap, hatter, uh, radio tap header that defines everything that goes into that particular interface. You'll have to define something very, very similar. So you give it uh, a name, uh, a, a type, and then uh, you know, kind of a bit of an offset. So step two, then you can even write some Python. And the Python piece is going to be the glue that goes from the output of the tool that you just wrote and shoves it into Kismet. And the closer to JSON that you make your tool, uh, the easier this will be for you. So let's quickly talk about RTL 433. When you run it from the command line, this is the JSON that it barfs out at you in the console. You got the time, uh, the brand, OS model, so on and so forth, and then the actual values. 
from the C++ side, you can take a look at the header file and you see inside of it that there's pretty much the exact same things. You define the different types of devices that are coming in via JSON and then the components of that code are all identical amongst all those different things. It's just shoving it into a different bucket so you know which bucket to then later pull it from. All right, so that's the header side. And these are exactly, like each one of those functions are pretty much exactly the same from each other. But if you take, uh, remember the uh, JSON, you can have multiple different types of values for them. All righty. Now on the C++ side, Kismet just got a packet. Uh, it just got this, you know, blob of data that just came in. What is it going to do with it? So it's going to take that JSON field, split it up, and then follow whichever object class that it uh, is going to need to, you know, execute code on in order to just shove it into whatever container it needs to uh, run in. It's pretty much that simple. To do the RTL 433 code uh, in C++ for both the header uh, and the uh, source code itself is almost uh, because of tabs and not spaces and, you know, beautifully formatted things and all that sort of stuff, it's probably about 120 lines of code. It's not that complex. Now on the Python side, uh, specifically with RTL 433, there's this uh, function for message queuing uh, that is unique to that particular application. So Mike wrapped that into it as well. And that, uh, you know, from the Python side, you define your uh, uh, Python source and you give it a, you know, am I going to use this particular message transport medium in order to shove it across or not? And if you are, then it has its other known code base in order to execute with that. Uh, against that and then finally you just say I want to open a device and then it just takes the output from standard in and then just shoves it into kismet for you and life is peachy. So it's pretty much easy peasy lemon squeezy like that that looks a little bit scary and a little bit difficult. Uh, Mike is stupidly helpful on this. The documentation is way more verbose uh, but those are the main concepts and constructs. You've got this data stream coming in, Kismet needs to know how to compartmentalize it into the different types of objects. The objects are very well uh, uh, documented and identified for you in your classes for both uh, public and private components. And then you just shove the data around. And it's a copy paste for the most part of that particular function. And I, that's that. I was going to say, if, if you're playing around with like home automation or you find something at home, like anything with that RTL 433 where you're expanding the existing tool, if you can get it into the RTL 433 tool, you have to write zero code to get it into Kismet because it's been done for you. Like if you can, if you can leverage an existing tool, yeah. it's it's um, it's mostly done for you. And um, if you yeah, if you ever want to get stuff into Kismet to to get that that kind of logging going, um, I regularly ask uh, Dragon questions over IRC. I'll ask him a casual question about some variable like go away and make breakfast and come back and there'll be like a 30 line response which is like now being integrated into the docs there'll be a code snippet like he he's so helpful and he's like oh yeah that is a bit confusing i fixed my documentation i fixed my code i fixed your code i've you know all, <laughs> and you're an idiot yeah yeah and i'm <laughs> but, like but without um, being like that yeah you, yeah i'm like i should you, well I, you I, feel like an idiot but he never can says I, that can i buy you a bit <laughs> like yeah i'm not really sure what to do but yeah so um, he's super helpful if you ever do want to get stuff into Kismet. But it, if you want to do just kind of the reverse engineering thing, uh, go download in Spectrum. Mike Walters has run away, so he doesn't <laughs> have to hear your uh, answer your questions. But he will be around, and he'll be around tomorrow. And uh, he's super super good at reverse engineering things as well. Um, as we have some experience in it. So yeah. if anyone does have anything they're kind of hacking on or working on at the moment, um, let us know, and I'm, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. And remember. It's not Wi-Fi. Yeah, very Any rarely Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, very right. rarely Wi-Fi. Um, that's our talk. That's, that's our talk. We're done. I is, there a, is there a talk after us? Yes, okay. there is a talk I, after us. I wonder why it suddenly got busy. Yeah.